Brian Bausch, welcome to the new school. Thank you, Michael. It's so wonderful to have you back at Commonweal. And let's just start at the beginning. How were you introduced to Commonweal? I was um, having a 30th birthday meltdown on a houseboat um, on a canal in Amsterdam mm -hmm. in the middle of a long bicycle trip when a friend who had been doing some consulting with Michael introduced me to Michael um, because they were looking for a medical director for this new organization, Commonweal. This was 1977, <laughs> right? And so Michael and I talked on the phone for quite a while, realized that there were a lot of common interests, and I came back to the U.S., and my wife at the time and I um, flew out, interviewed with uh, the folks out here, and decided this would be a good next thing to do with our lives. So um, I became the medical director of Commonweal. I guess I was the first. You were. Right. And um, we also had, as part of our mission, starting a family practice clinic for the town of Bolinas, which did not have a medical office at that point. And so we were kind of straddling those two worlds. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an experience. It was quite an experience. <laughs> that was the wild and woolly days. Right. Yeah. Well, we have stayed in touch and... Um, and our paths have reconverged uh, around our shared interest in integrative cancer therapies. And for me and many others in the field, um, you and our colleagues, uh, Keith Block from uh, a Chicago area and Mark Reniker, the three of you are somehow, um, for me, let me speak for myself, uh, among the leading touchstone people who have been uh, the, the pioneers of truly the complex evidence-informed version of integrative cancer therapies. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to do this because we've had these conversations both with Mark Reniker and with Keith Block. And um, so I was just very eager to do this. I'm very grateful mm. to you for, for coming. And thank you for your kind words, Michael. Well, absolutely. Mm. Could you say a little bit about your own family experience with cancer, which clearly informs this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so in 1997, mm -hmm. um, I developed a malignant growth in my neck and it was biopsied um, and he knew that it was cancer, but it clearly was not the primary tumor. But uh, the primary tumor could not be found. Mm. Did a lot of scans and a lot of, you know, root, you know, random biopsies of the area, you know, that the, this malignant metastatic node, meaning it had traveled to that node from somewhere to the area that it came from and couldn't, really couldn't get it. So I, at that point, was already in, involved in an integrative medical practice. I was, you know, providing primary care plus acupuncture, um, herbal therapies, nutritional therapies, had been doing a little bit of work with cancer patients, not a lot. Um, found out from Michael about Mark Reniker, who's you know, one of the other you know, kind of thought leaders in this field, and um, introduced myself to Mark and hired him as my advocate to help kind of plow my way through whatever was gonna happen next. And what I decided at that point was, even though I was being told that I needed to do chemotherapy and radiation, that it didn't make sense because we didn't know where the primary was and I was afraid I would use up valuable chips, um, you know, kind of shooting in the dark, as it were. So I did a major alternative medicine program. I went down to Optimal Health in San Diego, spent a few weeks down there doing an all raw vegan diet, um, uh, cleansing enemas, um, um, kind of their whole version of detox, lots of wheatgrass juice, um, exercise, some mind-body stuff. Um, lost a lot of weight, which I couldn't afford <laughs> on that program. Um, and, but starting with that and then starting to work with Michael Broffman uh, over in San Anselmo, who's a licensed acupuncturist who's had a lot of experience uh, with cancer as well, kind of mapped out a program of alternative therapies that I continued to work with um, and was able to keep that pretty much at bay for five years. Um, and then I got, you know, another lymph node popped up 
And then we, you know, and we were redoing the scans every six to eight months anyway, just looking, where's the primary, where's the primary? Anyway, after five years, the primary finally declared itself. It was at the back of my tongue. It was a squamous cell cancer. And so at that point, the Bay Area um, cancer community, ear, nose, and throat cancer community decided that the appropriate treatment was to do a hemiglossectomy, which means removing half of my tongue. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, and, um, and then to do uh, a radical lymph node dissection, which would mean stripping out all the lymph nodes in my neck and supraclavicular area, which would have cost me my sternocleidomastoid muscles, my external jugular veins, and my 11th um, uh, cranial nerve, the spinal accessory nerve. I would have been pretty debilitated after that. And then after that, they wanted to do radiation and chemotherapy. So in a fit of mild hysteria, I called Mark, um, and, and told him what was going on. And I said, you know, I just feel like this would be the end of my useful life if I go through all that. And he said, calmate, which in Spanish means calm down. <laughs> um, he said, give me a little time to work on this. Mark called me back, oh gosh, maybe a week later and said, um, okay, he said, last month's issue of um, Ear, Nose, and Throat Oncology had a wonderful article from MD Anderson mm -hmm. showing that your stage of this cancer has the same cure rate, roughly 80%, using only chemotherapy and radiation and eliminate all the surgery. Mm -hmm. So, and Mark then said, and I've just presented your case to um, Gary Clayman at MD Anderson, who's the head of the department. Um, he agrees with all that and you know, that that's what you should do and he wants to see you. So I want you to get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Texas. I said, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm there. So I did, I went back to Texas, had a full interdisciplinary workup at MD Anderson, you know, saw all the right people. And to a person, they all agreed, do not let anybody do surgery. It's only gonna add morbidity to your case. You've got an 80% chance of cure you know, of the cancer, whether you do the surgery or not, if you do, but you, do, you need to do chemo radiation. So armed with that, I came back to the Bay Area. Um, took me a while to convince the people back here to treat me without doing the surgery. That's a whole other story. Um, but eventually I did get treated. It was a very, very, very difficult treatment process because radiation to this area, because it's so narrow, it impacts um, so many of the tissues that um, I really couldn't eat for almost six months. Um, was in a lot of pain, was really you know, very sick, and utilized alternative therapies very heavily through that time. Acupuncture, um, osteopathic manipulation, um, some nutritional supplements, and you know, if I numbed my mouth extensively with like lidocaine solutions, I could swallow a little bit. And then eventually I went on TPN, which is total parenteral nutrition. It's given intravenously. So I was fed intravenously for about another three months and then started, you know, recovering from all that treatment. And as I was, and I, I took a year off from my practice. Luckily I had partners who were able to hold it together. And as I was looking at coming back into practice and looking at, okay, you know, this is obviously a life-changing event. What's not working for me in this practice? So as I was looking at, you know, what I felt I wanted to alter, I realized that one of the major frustrations for me was not having enough time to go deeply enough into complex cases in the way Mark had with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I called Mark and I said, will you train me to do the kind of work that you do? And he said, yeah, we can do that. So I spent, uh, for a year, I spent a day a week at Mark's office with him. And Mark's practice is done all by telephone. He rarely ever sees patients. Um, does, you know, very, very focused, very excellent medical literature searches for patients. And, um, and advocacy in the way that he did for me, calling, you know, calling the experts, trying to figure out. So I, you know, I spent that time with Mark learning how to do the same work and then incorporated it into my own practice as I came back to work. That was in 2002 that I went through my treatment. So that was 16, 16 years ago. And, um, and then practiced for another, well, until two years ago. Um, we, were, we were in Petaluma for a number of years, then opened a secondary office in Sebastopol. Um, which is where, uh, and Chris joined me just before we opened the Sebastopol office, Chris Holder, naturopathic doctor. And, uh, and then two years ago, I sold that practice to one of the other doctors um, in the practice, um, but still stay pretty connected um, in the field and still do a little bit of advocacy work um, with a few patients um, just to keep my brain busy. 
Um, but I actually spend most of the time on my sailboat in the South Pacific now. So, and I'll be flying back to Fiji in two weeks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything about what happened with Anita? Oh, sure. And right. So my wife, Anita, um, we were married in 1976. Uh, in 2008, she had a breast lump, um, had it worked up. It was cancerous. At the time, we were pretty sure, not positive, but pretty sure it was localized, early stage breast cancer. So she, and she wanted to do everything. So she had surgery, she had um, radiation, she had chemotherapy. Um, and then went on a very, very strong spiritual path, specifically with, qi, with Qigong. And so when her cancer um, metastasized and recurred two years later, mm -hmm. she was really unwilling to do any mainstream therapies. Um, and said she was going to do it spiritually. And of course, I disagreed with that, but I had, she was my wife and I had to support her mm -hmm. in that. And so that was the path that she took. Um, and she lasted for about another two years and then she passed mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, it was a very difficult time. It was hard for her. Um, she, yeah, she didn't, she didn't want to go that route. And so I had to mm -hmm. love her and, and respect it. Mm -hmm. so. How, uh, because we both work in the realm of the human psyche and spirit, how did you talked about both journeys, your journey and her journeys? How did your journey and then her journey change you internally? Hmm. Um, I think that internally, I, I think that. All of it gave me a much, much deeper respect for, deeper sense of and respect for spirituality mm -hmm. and the importance of spirituality, mm -hmm. not only in, in our lives, but in the conduct of our lives, um, how we are with other people, how we are with ourselves, you know, how forgiving we are of, you know, the mistakes that we've made ourselves mm -hmm. as well as others. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a desire to explore and experience some of those. So, you know, we both went very deeply into Qigong. Um, I've had a yoga practice for a long period of time. Now spending a little bit more time with um, Zen Buddhism um, and more attracted to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the main thing, mm -hmm. Michael. And your practice um, for all these years, a large part of it was with people with cancer, right? Um, mostly kind of between the time of my cancer and Anita's cancer, people started finding me. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of it had to do with the fact that they knew I had had and survived a cancer with a very difficult treatment and that therefore I must, you know, have some special knowledge. And so as people were coming to me, I realized I need to really bone up on this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really what people are coming to me for. I need to know more about this. So I started, you know, I, and Mark was very, very helpful with that. Um, Keith was very helpful with that. Um, we, you know, spent time back in Chicago with him. Um, and as I then started associating with naturopathic doctors who mm -hmm. I realized had a similar, but also very different view of the importance of, you know, looking at what causes the cancer, mm -hmm. as well as having amazing other tools to work with treating it and working with the side effects of the, the conventional therapies, um, it opened another whole dimension for me. And, I, mm -hmm. and I've often called the style of medical practice that I developed a naturopathic style. Mm -hmm. I would not be so arrogant as to call myself a naturopath, but it definitely was more, uh, more naturopathic. Well, what's interesting to me about that is that in the, um, you know, you know that uh, 21 years ago, I published a book called Choices in Healing, Integrating the Best of Conventional and uh, Complementary Approaches to Cancer from MIT Press, which happened to be the first book that was taken seriously on integrative cancer therapies by the mainstream medical community as well as the alternative one. And, um, and so in the intervening... Uh, uh, well, actually, I've been doing the Cancer Health Program for 33 years, and, uh, and this week will be our 200th week-long Cancer Health Program. So, uh, like you, I bring 
you know, we've both been on these parallel journeys for many years after you left Commonweal. Um, and uh, and when, when both of us started this work, uh, alternative and complementary cancer therapies were regarded as quackery, you know. I mean, it was flat out. I was told that by doing this work, I was endangering my reputation and Commonweal's survival. And actually, there was a big you know, deal about it at Commonweal. The people did not want me to do this work. It was like a really major event here at Commonweal. And, um, but I was, uh, I just knew I had to do it. Um, so we've walked through over this 30 year period, um, uh, it going from quackery to every major cancer center has some kind of integrative cancer program and bless them they've come a long way but what the mainstream cancer centers call integrative cancer therapy is uh, only a part of you know what we're talking about it's only a part in other words they get for the most part uh, diet stress reduction exercise social support uh, sometimes acupuncture. Sometimes acupuncture. Mm -hmm. They may get the importance of sleep. Uh, they can get the importance of finding meaning in your life. You know, we we think of those as sort of the the seven pillars of health promotion. You know, diet, exercise, stress reduction, social support, sleep. You know, uh, acup traditional Chinese medicine, or qigong, or tai chi. But when you start doing supplements or when you start doing diets beyond kind of a healthy diet, uh, then it gets very iffy for them. They want what they call evidence-based medicine. They want evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine currently means that there has been a randomized placebo-controlled study right. um, looking at people with a specific diagnosis who use a certain treatment compared to people with that same diagnosis who don't use that treatment, following them over a period of time and looking to see what the outcomes are. It costs millions of dollars to do those studies. And so who funds those studies? The drug companies. They're the ones who have the money and they're the ones who stand to profit the most from coming up with a new blockbuster drug. They're going to make billions on it. And so there's precious little incentive um, or finance to study something like curcumin, which we know has benefit in a variety of cancers and inflammatory conditions, but it's a cheap herb, you know? Right. Nobody's gonna make a fortune on it. So there's not gonna, you know, the, doing a big study means that some government agency has to come up, you know, and do it, or some institution that just happens to have gotten funded by a benefactor, so. That's and so it. let's add to this then, mm -hmm. they want evidence-based therapies in that sense. But another of the great thought leaders in the field, Donald Abrams, who's another colleague of ours, speaks of uh, integrative cancer therapies in the best sense as evidence-informed as opposed to evidence-based. Mm -hmm. So evidence-informed means that you're working with the evidence. And the, mm -hmm. the list of things here uh, uh, we go down it and we start with, you know, what are the highest levels of evidence, but then we take very seriously the evidence-informed therapies, you know. Um, and it, so the way I think about it, and you were kind enough at the start to say that this website that we're working on, Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies, is, is going to make a real contribution to the field. The way I think about it is that the government websites... Um, and the uh, academic center websites like Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson, they tend to be very conservative about these things, extremely conservative. Whereas the proponents tend to be way off to the other side, verging into really flaky or, 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 or worse. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do and what you do and what Keith Block does and Mark Renneker does and Donald Abrams does, we come right down the middle. In other words, we are doing this not in, we are not in the service of the government. We're not in the service of mainstream medical institutions. This is a patient focused approach. We want people to know 
what we would want to know as you were seeking. And it's different. It's not that the government-based thing is wrong. It's not that the academic centers are wrong, given their assumptions. It's not, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, but they don't take the point of view of, okay, what would you want to know if your life was at stake and you were open to these things, you know? So it's, it's a seriously, as you know, it's a seriously distorted field right now for patients. Above all, as we know from Keith Block's experience and many others, if you're a practicing oncologist and you want to try to do integrative oncology, it's close to impossible because um, of the way the reimbursement is structured now. If you're not part of one of these great megalithic structures, you know, you can't do it. But if you if you're part of one of those structures, you can't do this kind of medicine. Right. So as you pointed out, I think I'm really glad that you said you have a naturopathic style. The naturopathic community is actually critical to the existing state of this stuff because they have these naturopathic oncologists. Mm -hmm. And as we've done the research for this website, to my knowledge, there is no other professional community in the United States that is certifying naturopathic oncologists that have practitioners around the country where you can go to the naturopathic oncology website and look up where the practitioners are and which practitioners are the fellows the FABNO, I think it's called, the Fellows of the uh, Association, and, um, and actually find people who know something about it. Mm -hmm. you know? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was uh, actually made a big point of having naturopathic oncologists on, on staff, and some of them still do, but they've shifted their marketing focus from naturopathic oncology to innovative therapies of some kind. And and so uh, a lot of these naturopathic oncologists around the country got part of their tra training working at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, America right. which is, whatever else you want to say about it, uh, a mainstream, you know, treatment center. So the, the field, there's this infinite complexity that deserves in the deepest sense to be recognized and widely available and to have you know, one would want oncologists and other people to be able to do this work. And some of it yeah. depends on local licensing regulations as well. For example, yeah. Keith Block yeah. in Chicago, yeah. um, his license is more at stake working with, in, you know, innovative um, therapies that haven't been approved by the FDA right. than it would be if he were in California. I could get away, when I was in practice, I could get away with stuff here that he could not get away with. In, right. in Illinois. Yeah. Uh, and California is a more liberal state in terms of allowing physicians a little bit uh, broader palette uh, of treatments available, um, as is the Pacific Northwest. So I would say the West Coast is probably a lot better. Um, it's not only the physician licensing, is it naturopathic licensing at all? And which, which states accept that's right. Yeah. And Chris, um, if, you know, Chris can actually speak to that because he is the newly elected president of the California um, Naturopathic Board. Oh, terrific. Terrific. Chris, we're going to talk to you later in the, the, the conversation. Thank you very much. So um, <laughs> let's just so let's let's start with a broad conception of the field. I, I want to know how you think about it. I'm, I'll offer how I think about it, and then love your thoughts. I think about, the first, the importance of base, basic intrinsic health promotion, you know, the seven pillars of health, diet, exercise, stress reduction, social support, sleep, uh, whatever, finding meaning, mm -hmm. uh, traditional Chinese medicine, whatever else you want to add to that, um, which makes you a healthier person living with cancer, which means you are more able to be resilient in the face of whatever standard therapies you do, uh, improves quality of life, and may well extend life or, uh, or reduce the risk or delay, the, uh, delay recurrence. In other words, there's a whole series of things that anybody can do, right? Basic health promotion, becoming a healthier person living with cancer. So to me, that's the starting place. Now, do you take a different view for that or is that? No, and, and the one thing I would 
add to that is the importance of looking at etiologic factors um, mm -hmm. in the genesis of whatever illness the person's working with, mm -hmm. whether it's cancer or in a cardiovascular. Um, and a lot of that has to do with toxicity, which you guys have been involved in, you know, looking at for years here. You know, what has our environment done to our genome? You know, the genome is the, you know, kind of the basic imprint that we're born with, but then there's the epigenetics, all of the factors that influence what happens in our genes, whether a gene's turned on or off because of the presence of, you know, benzene in the environment or um, chlorine, you know, or, you know, um, you know, plasticizers, um, you know, that can interfere with normal hormone production. Um, and so, I think that, the, you know, another important part of that has to do with getting, and this is something that conventional doctors are not addre addressing, but some kind of testing to look at what is somebody's toxic load. And there are various ways to do that. Some are very expensive and very elegant. Others are relatively inexpensive and still give good information. Um, and a lot of that has to, comes out of the field known as functional medicine. Um, are you all familiar with the term? People not familiar with functional medicine? Okay. Let's, let's, let's say what functional medicine yeah. is. Yeah, so functional medicine is a term that was coined about 25 years ago that looks at analyzing somebody's health issues, not necessarily based on a specific Western medical diagnosis, but rather on what's not working properly in the body. For example, is there gastrointestinal dysfunction? Is there neurological dysfunction? Is there, you know, are there inflammatory markers that suggest that somebody might be more prone to an autoimmune condition? Um, and so it kind of backs away from the standard medical model of set of symptoms, physical exam, takes you to a specific diagnosis, which then takes you to a treatment algorithm. That's the way doctors practice medicine. Um, and that's the way I did. That's the way I was trained initially. With functional medicine, I became more interested in looking at, well, let's do some stool testing and find out what the person's microbiome looks like. Do they have evidence of what we call leaky gut syndrome, where they're absorbing abnormal toxins from the gut into the bloodstream? Um, what about a heavy metal analysis? Does this person have excessive amounts of mercury or lead or cadmium, all of which, you know, you know, can be big potential problems for downstream health um, issues. Um, and a variety of other tests like that, which gives you a kind of a broader picture of how is this person relating to their environment? How is their body relating to the environment? And then there are specific treatments that have been developed that go along with those functional medicine analyses. Um, so that's a big part of it. And integrative medical doctors do this for the most part. That's the functional medicine piece. And the integrative word means that they're combining, usually combining the best of Western medical diagnosis and treatment with the functional medicine component as well. So because we're on detox for a moment and we could want to go into that a little deeper, as you say, we've been deeply involved with um, chemical work through the Collaborative on Health and the Environment and lots of other projects for, for over 20 years. Um, and, and we actually were the first group of people together with Environmental Working Group to know what toxics were in our body uh, in the original thing that was done for the Bill Moyers film and so on. Yeah, I know. I saw the list that were in you. Yeah, right, right. Um, it's but pretty impressive. So the expensive ways to do it, it can be hundreds of, uh, of things, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of tests. What, what are the inexpensive ways that yield good evidence on this? Um, I like the um, urine toxic metal analysis that we've used for years from a company called Doctors Data. Mm -hmm. Doctors Data has been, you know, pulled to the mat by the FDA, mm -hmm. of course, but they're still able to do the testing. Um, there, you know, there's been a variety of tests that we've used over the years to look at other hydrocarbons um, and other toxics that show up. Chris, what are you, what are you using now? What's, what's uh, the main? Great Plains Laboratory, the uh, fat soluble toxin test and the mycotoxin test. Yeah. Right. Um, we've also been looking at what we call biotoxin illnesses, one of which is mold, 
which is, you know, has become a huge issue, um, especially in areas that, you know, that are rainy and damp mm -hmm. and that maybe don't get a lot of sun where mold spores can grow. And people who develop mold sensitivities really have impacted immune systems, which then may become either more prone to autoimmune conditions or sometimes more prone to developing immune deficiency related things like cancer as well. Um, I like the stool testing, and I think maybe you remember from the conference we had here a couple of years ago when I presented on the importance of the, the microbiome in cancer treatment. What's been found is that people who have a large percentage of certain bacteria in the gut um, actually have a better response to certain chemotherapies than people who don't. Yeah. Forgive me just a second. Ken, could you just close my computer because it's distracting to me to see this. And I don't. Uh, you don't need to have it. Slide. I don't need it now. If we need to fire it up, we'll fire it up. But it's just distracting to watch it. Thanks. It's, Can thank I you. turn off the projector for now? Yeah, let's do adds that. Adds extra yeah, noise. Yeah. Good. And as uh, and as and as part of that, um, what we were doing in my starting to do in my last couple of years of practice was looking at okay, so how do we get the right microbiome into people? Um, either because they have significant GI issues or because they're going to be undergoing cancer treatment and we want to optimize it. Um, so we were doing stool testing, looking at you know, breakdowns of the specific types of bacteria. And if somebody needed something that wasn't available from a simple probiotic, you know, that, and the probiotics typically contain acidophilus and bifidus, I think most of you are familiar with that, um, then we were looking at arranging for fecal transplants Fecal transplant means taking stool from somebody who has the known bacteria and then implanting it into the colon of the patient that you're right. working with. And historically, it's been done through colonoscopy and the gastroenterologists were doing this. Mm -hmm. But more recently, there's a company that has been making freeze-dried um, fecal transplants in capsule form that can be swallowed. Mm -hmm. And then these capsules don't dissolve until they get into the small intestine and the colon and then can populate that area with the bacteria. And Right now, it still looks like bacteria, Bacteroides fragilis is the bacteria that seems to have the most immunotherapeutic effect in terms of getting the immune system ready to deal with treating the cancer and what optimizing it. What company is that? Uh, Chris, help. Open Biome. Open Biome. Open Biome. Yeah. Is that the one out of the UK? No, they're in the East Coast. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of moving slowly right. along, but it's moving. Now, Let's just also help people understand that in the field, there's something of a differentiation between integrative medicine and functional medicine. You know, like integrative medicine classically are the people who train with Andy Weil at uh, the University of Arizona or whatever. And, um, and uh, there's, and then functional medicine people typically are trained through the Institute for Functional Medicine, which was Jeff Bland and that group of people. And while a lot of physicians actually consider themselves both integrative and functional, so they blend it, there is a, a bit of a tension between the two fields. In, in other words, that the functional medicine people, uh, from the point of view of more classical integrative medicine people, do a great deal of expensive testing and uh, prescribe a lot of supplements that go beyond what the integrative medicine people do. So there are both people who engage with both, but then there's this tension between them. And what's been really interesting to me is that the Institute for Functional Medicine, which I understand why, hasn't offered cancer modules for a long time. Now, partly you can say that that's because, uh, you know, they look at the underlying organ system structure, which, by the way, is similar to naturopaths, right? I mean, there's a there's a historical lineage, it seems to me, between naturopathic medicine and, um, and functional medicine. And the I totally agree. Underlying, yeah. I sometimes think of functional medicine as naturopathic medicine on steroids. You know that it's kind of a, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's different. But mm -hmm. uh, a lot of testing, a lot of supplements, and almost all of the naturopaths that I've come in contact with totally incorporate functional medicine yeah. into their into their practice. It's as well as integrative in a lot of ways. So there's a kind of a triangle, if you want. Right. With naturopathic representing a very ancient tradition in many ways. And then it coming down into integrative medicine and, natu and functional medicine. It's one way of thinking about it in any case. Yeah. So in terms of detox, um, 
One thing that, that really comes to mind, I mean, obviously you want to get the toxins out of your environment or out of your body. Um, but then you've had all this chemotherapy, right? And so both in terms of detox before treatment or in, in lieu of and after, what do you recommend? What do you use? Um, let me tell you a little about my own history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so after I bit the bullet and went through radiation and chemotherapy, yeah. um, I stunk. I smelled so bad, it was yeah. driving me insane. Nobody else seemed to smell it, but boy, did I smell it. It was in my clothes, it was in my sweat. Um, I was pretty sure it was from the platinum-based mm. therapy that I'd had. And so I decided I need to go and do a detox. I need to get this stuff out of my body because the chemotherapies don't, the little bit of residual that you have after treatment doesn't do anything for killing cancer cells, but it continues to be toxic. Um, so I discovered a um, detoxification uh, treatment center in upstate New York called the Body Mind um, Retreat Center, where they had a very robust detox program incorporating an Ig and Wigmore who was a naturopath in the 60s style, uh, all raw vegan diet, um, combined with drinking lots of wheatgrass juice, um, doing cleansing enemas or colonics, um, saunas once to twice daily, uh, an exercise program, and a, and a very, very rich um, spiritual Zen Buddhist program, all combined in the same thing. And I said, okay, that's for me. So um, I went back and stayed there um, for three weeks and by the fourth day, I stopped smelling. And this had been going on for like four or five months at that point. I said, okay, this is it, right? And so I've actually gone back there every year for the last, well, ever since 2002, I've gone back every year. Mm. And I now return, um, when I go back, I go back for the entire month of August, along with my partner, Kim, and we're staff. So we, right. we get to do the program, but we also get to work and kind of give back at this point. Um, so that program um, by itself is very rich in the detox. And I actually did a toxic panel before and after the last one to see if I could alter some of the chemicals that we were talking about. And, um, and I actually did see some of them come down. And a couple of the others actually went up. And, and, the, and our interpretation on that is it's because they were being liberated from the fat soluble portions in my body and were on their way through the liver to get excreted and hadn't quite gotten out yet. So I'll do another one to follow up on that and see. So if a person with cancer who's been through chemo is listening to this at home or on a podcast or a video, uh, in order of importance and things that people could do easily at home, what would you say to them? What, what are the pieces of that that would really matter? I think diet is yeah. quite important. Um, you know, I, you know, for many years I've seen the value um, and usefulness and results of doing an all raw vegan diet. Mm -hmm. um, recently, and we'll get into this a little bit more, I've become more interested in looking at um, both paleo and then ketogenic diets, mm -hmm. um, specifically for people with inflammatory issues and cancer. <clears throat> um, exercise is super important, something, some kind of cardiovascular exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, the American Heart Association lists 150 minutes a week as the kind of minimum uh, of cardiovascular exercise. And cardiovascular exercise should be at approximately 80% of your predicted maximum heart rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what that often means is that for us in our 70s, early 70s, mm -hmm. we would be looking at heart rates somewhere around 118 Mm -hmm. so 116, 118. For a much younger person, they're going to be up around 150, 160. But sustaining that for a total of 50 minutes a week or 150, so three times 50, you know, or five times 30, and you can break it up in different ways. So exercise, diet, um, I believe strongly in the power of a mind-body practice also, whether it's Tai Chi or Qigong or um, uh, Buddhist meditation or Vipassana meditation. Yoga. And yoga, and I've experimented with all of them, and you know, and include them. You know, um, I think the saunas are a super important part of detox, and it's my one criticism of Optimal Health in San Diego is that they don't incorporate saunas. S sweat is one of the ways that we get rid of toxins in our body. There's no question about it. And if you have any question, doubt about that at all, 
go sit in the sauna for, you know, an hour on a towel and then smell the towel when you get out. <laughs> it reeks of ammonia. So do you have views on traditional saunas versus the, what do you call it, the infrared sauna? Far infrared? Yeah. Um, I've been critical of far infrared. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it's been mostly kind of scammy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there's really any good data that shows. And, and the importance of sauna is not that you're heating the body. The importance is that you're sweating. Mm -hmm. That's where the detox comes from. I'm sure that there are other views on there, yeah. and I would be happy to entertain such mm -hmm. views. But um, I have a little sauna at home, and I just have a little mm -hmm. Finnish electric heater in it. And I go in, and I sweat, and I'm happy <laughs> with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and back at the Mind Body, which I'm a place in New mm -hmm. upstate New York, which I'm obviously mm -hmm. promoting because I love no, that no, place. No, no, it's good. It's they okay. have um, two. They have actually have three saunas. They have a men's sauna and two women's saunas. Mm -hmm. Each one next to its own very large pond, mm -hmm. so you can you know, sauna and then dip, you know, and mm -hmm. get cold and then come back into the sauna. And, and of course, it becomes a social setting as mm -hmm. well. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and the importance of, you know, connection mm -hmm. with other people, you know, being involved, you know, I mean, walking into a place where all of a sudden you're surrounded by other people who have what you have or had what you had mm -hmm. or being a Jew and going to Israel for the first time and going, oh, my God, this is amazing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so that connection with your community mm -hmm. in some way. You know, this is a divergence, but it's been on my mind. I, I give talks from time to time on the healing power of love, you know? And um, mm. from 33 years in the Cancer Help Program, I just have to say that the healing power of love is to me the, the, the greatest healing power, mm -hmm. you know? Um, um, and, and of course, there's so many forms of love, right? You know, um, but the Sufis have a, a saying, which I just love, which seems to me very deep. The friend with a small F leads to the friend with a big F, the friend with a big F being the divine. And, and one of the paths to healing is, um, when we, see the eternal in another human being, you know, when we have that experience. And, and I, I have found in my own life that meditation has been a harder path to the eternal than, you know, deep friendship or, or love where I can access the eternal through another actual human being, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and Steve and Andrea Levine have spoken so eloquently about that yeah, in, in their books and in yeah. their talks. Yeah, And I, I recently witnessed something very extraordinary. I had a friend with a long, long history of totally debilitating chronic illnesses of the kind that you work with all the time and, and or did work with in, in your practice. I'm sure Chris does. And, um, and this friend... Um, rediscovered um, her birth religion, which was Christian, but at a very deep level, you know, at a very deep level. And there was a profound shift in her complex chronic issue. And what, what I began to put together, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in, in China, there is a tradition, it's a sub-tradition of what's called virtue healing. It's when it was like an 18th century monk who was very compassionate about all the poor people who couldn't afford the acupuncture and the herbs and all that stuff. And um, so he began to take people in and just um, allow them or help them get back to the core of what of virtue in their lives. And there was a point at which in this process, most of them would vomit, you know, vigorously as they purged themselves of the ways of being that had not been helpful to them. And so I began to connect that. And, and there were all kinds of people, and that's a contemporary who also does this, all kinds of people with cancer and many other difficult who recovered, 
you know? So I began to put that together with the fact that at Lourdes, you know, the, the miracle cures at Lourdes, which are virtue healings. You know, people go to Lourdes, believers go to Lourdes, or some non-believers, and as you know, the Catholic Church has an extraordinarily impeccable way of reviewing, quote, miracles at Lourdes. It's one of the most systematic in the world. Mm -hmm. And there are people where, who had metastases to the bone, where the bone heals up, you know. So in terms of the healing power of love, to me, when you can connect deeply to another human being, but when that, the friend leads to the friend and it leads you to the divine in whatever form that is, I find in all the different traditions, in the Asclepian healing traditions of Greece, where people stayed in the Asclepian centers waiting for a dream that would whisper to them what their path was, um, and in the miracles from Christ onward in the Christian tradition with Lourdes, and, you know, in all the different traditions, this amazing grace that sometimes people not only transform their relationship with life and death so that they no longer fear death, right? But sometimes they actually recover in an astonishing way. Mm -hmm. And I don't say it's frequent, mm -hmm. but it seems to me it's not an either or, it's a continuum. And so what I have seen an infinite number of times in 200 cancer health programs is... Lots of people who don't recover necessarily, but they outlive their prognoses by decades, mm -hmm. you know? And so often it seems to me that whatever else is going on, that they reconnected with the healing power of love and with their own inner sense of what right life is. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with those things? I, I was just actually thinking about my, um, my most favorite story about this is I, I was seeing a woman for a number of years who had multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. kind of at a median stage and was trying to mm -hmm. avoid some of the more toxic therapies and um, we got her a little inflatable hyperbaric chamber that she mm -hmm. could use at her house and she mm -hmm. would use that periodically but you know I was just seeing the neurological picture deteriorate mm -hmm. over a period of years and then she didn't come in and I didn't see her for I don't know four or five years and she showed back up one day and she looked fabulous I said okay what'd you do <laughs> She said, well, she said, my old high school boyfriend showed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said he had been married and divorced. And, you know, you know my story. You know, and I, you know, my, boy, you know my significant other left me four years ago. And we've kind of hooked up. And she said, ever since we got back together, I've just been getting better and better. Yeah. So I, okay. Great. Yeah, those, those stories are extraordinary. Um, Ian Gawler had a, uh, the Australian guy who did cancer work, and it's controversial, but he had a story of one of his patients who was in a bad marriage and uh, had a bad cancer and retreated to her, uh, her beach house on the coast, leaving her family behind with a case of sherry and, you know, just got out of a bad marriage and drank sherry and did really well, you know? <laughs> And then there are the whole set of mm -hmm. uh, recovery, metastatic cancer recovery cases in Japan of poor farmers who didn't have the money for any surgery or anything else, but they just surrendered their lives to God and a whole set of them. You know, so I think mm -hmm. what we're both saying is mm -hmm. that we've talked about the health promoting practices and then we can and will talk about all the complex things. But at the same time, beyond the health promoting practices, it's just this contact with love or the divine. And, you know, and it's either human or, or divine forms or both, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and just the infinite power of that yeah. to heal. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and actually going back to my story, yeah. one little snippet. So after my original you know, when the first metastatic lump appeared in 1997, mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that I did besides doing the, you know, the detox and stuff was I went out and bought a sailboat and started spending a lot of time sailing on the bay because I'd always loved sailing and I had done it when I was younger and just went and got a little 26-foot boat that I could also do little weekend trips on and stuff. And that was, that was a part of my healing as well. Absolutely. Yeah.
In fact, something about that, because I've been thinking about the healing power of love a lot, because I'm about to give a talk on it in Houston at the Jung Institute. Ooh. And um, one of the things I would often think about it is that when there's the transcendent experience of falling in love, like your, your patient, um, there is this sense of, of connection not only to the individual, but you're seeing the universal through the individual. But then what happens is you actually start living together and you run into all the human realities of living with another person. And therefore, very often that transcendent experience dissipates or, or disappears completely. And there can be a great sense of disappointment about that. So, um, so what are the forms of love that that don't disappear that way. And, and so sailing is a great example, but nature, pets, you know, it doesn't disappear with pets. Mm -hmm. It doesn't disappear with passionate hobbies or things that one, you know, deeply loves, um, you know, relationship with music or whatever art, it is, yeah. art whatever yeah, it absolutely. is. So the cultivation of forms of love that will not disappoint you. I mean, human love can be transcendent, but then it becomes problematic so often. And so what are the forms of love that keep you in relationship with you know, the divine? Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's a very interesting yeah. thing. And I, and I absolutely believe that not only is it important to, to stay connected with that, but also to learn new forms of artistic expression as well because there are now studies that show that that helps to prevent um, age-related cognitive deficiencies like right. Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm currently learning jazz guitar, which is awesome. Whoa, how amazing. <laughs> it is amazing.